Okay, so I'm working with uh, Natalia, Rene, Ashley, and uh, David on that project. Um, so I will first present uh, quickly a recap of what is state representation learning, then uh, present the different environments we are working on and the um, early results uh, we have, and also give some uh, details about uh, yeah, the tools we are using and what works and what doesn't. So, uh, as Natalia mentioned uh, yesterday, so in classic reinforcement learning, you have observation and you try to learn a policy from observation. Okay. Uh, and uh, so you try to learn directly from raw pixels. And in state representation learning, you try to learn uh, an intermediate representation that keeps only the useful information to, to solve that task. So, have a low dimensional. Um, uh, domain on which you will then learn a policy. So here you have an example of a task, so that's from uh, the paper of Jankowski, where you have a mobile robot that evolved in a square environment and it gets a positive reward when he is in top right corner and negative reward when he hit um, a wall. So as input he has a 360 uh, view of the environment and as a result, uh, so we can learn um, from only the pixel, it succeeds to learn the position. So here, each dot represents an observation, so an image from the camera. And the color denotes the reward. So positive rewards are in red, so it's all the in the top, top right corner. Uh, negative rewards are in blue, and when as there's no reward, it's the, the gray um, uh, white dots. Uh, so we are currently comparing different methods, so auto denoting autoencoder, variational autoencoder. Also we are doing uh, supervised learning on the ground, uh, using ground truth uh, as target, so the, I will uh, dig a bit more what is we call ground truth in our case. Uh, also PCA and we are focusing on robotic priors, so uh, as a recap just uh, from yesterday, so when you learn a representation using robotic priors, you give some prior knowledge about the world to your robots. So for instance, that states will only uh, evolve gradually. And we are also experimenting uh, learning states with uh, multiple cameras. So that's more the work of uh, René on that. So here are the two uh, environments uh, we are uh, focusing on. So at first we were working uh, with a Baxter robot in a gazebo simulator. Uh, so the goal here is to push uh, a button so to reach a 3D space on, on the table. Uh, and we have different also distractor in it. But we switch uh, for reinforcement learning to have a faster simulation. We switch to PyBullet using a KUKA robot or a KUKA arm here. The, um, so as input for the two, we have only the image. And as, as output, I, I will uh, say a bit more later. And so still the, the goal is to uh, push uh, the button. So, and we are also trying different type of rewards, so sparse rewards, so when uh, the robot touches the button, it gets a positive reward, when it's too far, it gets a negative reward, and anywhere else, it just gets no reward. And we are also trying with uh, shaped rewards, so a reward that is proportional to the distance uh, to the button. Uh, okay, and for the two uh, data sets, so for this uh, data set for Baxter, we used a uh, policy, um, uh, uncoded policy to learn this, uh, to explore uh, the state, so it was directed to, to the button. Okay, uh, it needs the password, so. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I will continue anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you, you should you should maybe just change that. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so we are we had uh, a policy directed to to the goal, and for uh, KUKA we just use a random policy to uh, generate the data. Uh, so a random policy in the X Y Z space. Uh, okay. So next. So here uh, are the learned states so for the Baxter environment. On the left, you have what we call the ground truth. So this is the X, Y, Z position of the arm in the environment. And on the right, you have the, the learned states. Here it's for robotic priors. So as before, uh, the red dots, the color denotes the reward. So red dots are positive. Uh, 
blue dots, it means negative reward, so when it's outside uh, a safety box around uh, the robot, and uh, not reward is a gray. And as you can see, uh, the robot express uh, more or less captures the structure of, of this environment, putting all the positive rewards together. And we have the same so for uh, the KUKA environment. So here uh, it appears to be much smoother because the delta in the, st um, in the action space is, uh, is uh, smaller. And so this is the, 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 the this is the same thing as before, but in for the KUKA uh, robot. And as before, we see that it more or less captures uh, the structure. So how do we evaluate the state? So we have uh, two uh, solutions to uh, evaluate, evaluate the state. First, we propose so, um, a measure base on, uh, on the that compares the structure of what we, we consider to be the ground truth, so the best uh, states to, to solve the task. And it compares this structure with the structure of the learned state. So basically, uh, the idea is if the neighborhood of, th of the states is the same in the learned state as in the ground truth, that should be a good uh, thing. And the second evaluation is because we learned state representation learning for reinforcement learning is obviously to, do, uh, to evaluate the performance uh, of reinforcement learning algorithm using those states. Uh, so quickly, here are the different uh, just different metrics we had for uh, the Baxter. So it was uh, the Baxter robot with uh, different uh, destructors, so different object that was not useful to solve the task. And also for um, the KUKA with only uh, the static button. We are also planning to do something more complex later. And um, so as we can see, uh, well, obviously, uh, in the ground truth, you have the lowest value. And uh, for the simple task, if when you don't have any distractor, anything that is not relevant to the task, the different me methods perform more or less uh, the same. But then the difference comes when you add some objects, some distractor in the image that the autoencoder will try to reconstruct, but that will be not useful to solve the task. So that was for uh, Canon MSE. And here um, I will talk about a bit more about uh, reinforcement learning we, we are working on. So we are using OpenAI baselines. I don't know if any of you tried to uh, just unify uh, them. It, it's quite, they, they, don't use, they don't have any coherence in, in their code. So it was quite uh, difficult to uh, integrate, just saving and loading agents. So we, we unified everything. Uh, and now we, are, so we have all those baseline available uh, in our project. We also added a recent algorithm from, I think, Benjamin Recht, uh, which is really close also to evolution strategy. Basically, the, uh, the, um, the main uh, power of this algorithm is that if you have a big cluster of CPU, uh, it can be really fast to, uh, to do lots of uh, simulation because it's highly parallel parallelizable. And for now, the algorithm, algorithm we are focusing on is PPO because it's the one that works without any uh, hyper, hyper parameter tuning. So we did not do any uh, gradient student descent on that. And it was working fine. So we, we just want the algorithm that works the, the best. So we are trying lots of different algorithms. And for now, it's PPO and the GPU implementation. So it's called PPO2 on OpenAI baselines. Yeah. Yeah, they, in fact, we, we, are, we are using also those two. We, are, we tried both. And the one in OpenAI baseline with the um, default iPad parameter, we are working best. So we, we kept that. So it was one fun. Both. Uh, yeah, in fact, we, most of our code, I will uh, say that a bit later, but mo most of our code is in PyTorch, so for learning representation. Uh, and we had some agent in PyTorch. But because OpenAI baseline is implemented in TensorFlow, so we had also to use TensorFlow. Okay, but so you are using TensorFlow for the uh, For the baselines, OpenAI baselines, it's TensorFlow. Okay. But the, all, all the, the remainder, it's PyTorch. And yeah, uh, it would be better if it was also PyTorch, but anyway. Uh, okay, uh, so that's the different algorithm we, we tried. Um, 
and next. Okay. And we are also uh, experimenting in, in different uh, so different uh, things as input. So we are uh, trying with raw pixel directly with a ground truth in the X Y Z uh, space. We are also trying with joints uh, as input, so the, the different joint angles. And obviously, we we are also experimenting with uh, the land states. And for the action space, we. We tried different things, so um, using district action in the XYZ space, using continuous action in that space, and also uh, using uh, continuous action in the joint space. And, and we will just try to keep the one that works best uh, for our task. So here, um, this is for, uh, so the sitting is for the KUKA arm, uh, using discrete action. And we compare uh, so the different uh, approaches uh, of state representation learning uh, with also the raw pixels. And we use so we use a random agent to gather uh, ten uh, thousand uh, steps of uh, experience for learning a, represent a state representation. And then we with that fixed state representation, we train uh, an algorithm to convergent on that. So it. For the different algorithm, in fact, it should be a bit shift uh, that way to be fair with the uh, raw pixels. So as you can see, and here you have the baseline of just acting randomly in in the environment. And it is uh, we use also rewrite shaping, so it's easier to compare the different algorithm because if with only sparse reward, it's uh, it's harder to yeah to show the learning curve. So, as expected, uh, when we give the ground truth, which is the relative position uh, to the button, so between the arm uh, and the button, uh, and which is not noisy at all, well, it performed best uh, and learned, uh, learned quick. And the, the main difference here is with raw pixels. With raw pixels, so it needs lots of samples to uh, converge, and also it has a lot of variation. So some runs here, so there's more than like 10 runs, some of them just fades. At the end, uh, of, at the end of one million steps, there's, uh, it's still uh, worse than random. So, uh, and the different method also, we can see uh, that the different uh, methods for learning state representation are more or less uh, equal. Because here in the setting, we have only so useful information in the observation. Uh, when we will add distractors, so something that the autoencoder will try to reconstruct, we expect uh, those different methods to perform a bit worse than uh, using the robotic priors that tends to ignore a distractor. <coughs> uh, yeah, and for now and here, it's only using PPO. Also, the difference uh, here, I did not mention, so. Um, we use a fu fully connected uh, network for learning policy for state representation learning. And here we are using uh, the default uh, network from OpenAI baseline, which are convolutional neural nets. So we should maybe uh, do a bit of hyperparameter tuning for the raw pixel to be a bit more fair. C could you, uh, so I'm not sure I understood. So um, do you use uh, convol convolutional uh, layers uh, for all networks here, or for non-networks, or for some of them? Okay, um, okay, I should be clear. So, for the policy ne network, uh, we are using convolutional neural nets only for the raw pixel, because for raw pixel we have images as input, and for state representation, uh, for learning policy on learned state, we have states as input, so it's no, it's low, low dimensional. But for learning the states, we use convolutional neural networks. Yeah. So it basically, it's convol convolutional VAE, convolutional auto encoder. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And could you say how much uh, is the shift you should make to account for the step representation learning step? Yeah. So it's it's ten thousand steps, so like more than that. Uh, ten thousand or. Yeah. Much more? Smaller. Small, yeah, yeah. Like it's one, one twentieth of that, I think. So it's really quite, yeah. You said that sometimes it's, it fails. In your opinion, is, is it due to PPO or is it due to the station learning part? Uh, <laughs> uh, why raw pixel fails? 
Uh, I, um, wh when I say it fails, it's only for uh, yeah for the raw pixel. So uh, well, I don't I don't know yet. It's, so it's very early results, uh, and we should also uh, yeah we have some scripts to to look at what was learned, and so I think I will learn I, I will look at those fails failure to to see, but we don't know yet. It's okay. <laughs> Um, Sorry. Yeah. So your own pixels, in fact, it is CNN features applied to them, right? That's what you do. You apply a CNN on a uh, on the image so on the, the, the yellow curve is a CNN. So the, the yellow CNN features. Uh, yeah, it's well, you, you it's like uh, it's end-to-end -end learning. Uh, what you usually do uh, with deep reinforcement learning, so you give the image as input and you try to learn the policy directly from the image. I directly. Yeah. I thought there was CNN. Okay. Yeah, the, it's it's a, the policy network is a CNN, but uh, a different way to say this is that in uh, VAE, SRL, and uh, raw pixels you have CNN, but in VAE and the SRL they are trained on other objective functions, yeah. like reconstructing uh, the image for VAE, and in raw pixel you are just they are just trained by reinforcement learning. So it means that um, eventually what you are comparing is uh, CNN features and uh, Jankowski uh, uh, prior uh, with prior. On one side we train CNNs with Jankowski prior and use them with uh, reinforcement learning after. And on the other side we train the CNN directly by the reinforcement learning. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's denoting autoencoder, so we just add some some noise to to the input and it reconstructs the the output. Yeah. Right, but so here the the autoencoder, well, the the transformation thing works, but the autoencoder is not doing bad either. Really. No, uh, both are quite fine here. It's the problem is much too simple. To yeah, 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 that's what I was uh, going to Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very first the task. Reduction, uh, the reduction, the trick to do is very good and uh, pretty short OK. Um, any question? More? OK. So, um, So here are some tips and tricks we, we had to do to make it work. So uh, the one. A uh, very trick that we add must uh, we add to do is remove the action of going up. So that was also done in a recent paper where they introduce also the KUKA environment. So if you allow the robot to go up, uh, then there's too much space to uh, to explore and it doesn't um, doesn't touch uh, the button at any point, even with so with a random policy. Uh, also, obviously, for learning a stage representation, uh, you need a good exploration policy. So here, just a random uh, random policy was working well, but you need to experience enough uh, different uh, rewards. So you have something. So you have yeah, you have different exper experience. For instance, if you only experience uh, null rewards, you you can do anything from that. Uh, it's harder to learn a representation, so you need to experience positive rewards, negative rewards. Uh, Different uh, and explore your environment. What was the exploration you use here? Uh, it's just uh, for KUKA. Uh, it's just a random agent, just acting uh, randomly in in the space. So it was uh, the random exploration was uh, uh, touching the button often enough. Yeah, so it's just just uh, really sometimes. Uh, it's yeah, because here for now the the button is just uh, right under the arm. But so do you, do you have also the the Removing a faction also in the exploration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, for uh, tweaking the reward, it's more for uh, continuous action because for continuous action, we are currently experimenting some problem with reward shaping. So uh, the the Kuka arm just minimizes reward by smashing the arm on the table. Uh, so yeah, we are, we have some trouble with that, and also uh, for it's more for the priors, we needed uh, to reduce the um, the sphere safety sphere around the button where we get, uh, give a negative reward. So it experiences uh, different uh, yeah, yeah different experience of doing the same action with, but with different rewards. Uh, so we had to do some tweaking of the rewards, and as Florian says, uh, normalize your state. Uh, 
uh, always normalize your states. Uh, so before, so just uh, last week, I was starting to present uh, the curve, but uh, ground truth was performing worse than uh, VA uh, version of the tongue coder, and that was a bit weird. Uh, and so I I normalized the states, and and then uh, it's it's. Uh, it, the results were much more stable, and it was uh, working better for uh, ground truth. So, yeah, normalize your state okay, always. So, do you normalize the, the learned state representation, for example? Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, the, the way it is done is uh, you learn a state representation, and then when you learn the policy, you compute a running uh, a mean average, a running average of uh, the states, and you uh, subtract by the mean and divide by the running st standard deviation. You compute it. So if it's afterward, it's during training. Yeah, it's it's really close to to that. Um, yeah. And so okay, a bit too fast. Uh, so obviously we are using Python with PyTorch for most of the code. So we are um, we had to use TensorFlow, which is not good a good thing for us for the baselines. And we uh, and we had also to tweak OpenAI baseline to work with uh, state uh, state representation because uh, OpenAI baseline currently some algorithm only work with images uh, they don't provide anything to work with something that that in images so it's really made for Atari. Um, also, they some of their function for saving or loading the agent are not working so we had to implement them again and yeah. And so we switch uh, here. It's a small fight uh, about a simulator. So we switch from Gazebo to PyBullet. So at first we were using Gazebo mostly because uh, we could use ROS. Uh, our goal um, afterwards is to use it on a real robot. So the idea is, if it was working with Gazebo, it should more or less work with a real robot. The problem with that is so it has uh, it's a big dependency using ROS, and ROS can be different from one system to another. It's quite slow, so we had only 0 0.5 frames per second with Baxter, so it was yeah, too, too slow for reinforcement learning. If you want to do one million step as 0 0.5 frames per second, I'll let you compute the, the time unit. Uh, and also, um, Gazebo tends to be non-deterministic. I mean, when you launch twice a simulation, sometimes uh, Gazebo br breaks and sometimes it works, so just just the hell of working uh, with that, and so on the other side you have PyBullet, which is quite easy to use. Um, it's it's made it's uh, yes a netless mode, so it's quite easy to uh, do um, to have different processes uh, running yeah running at the same times and has almost no dependency. So that's a cool thing you can just install it really quickly. Uh, for both the documentation of are so so so. Gazebo is older, so you have more documentation, but still uh, you, you need to dig more to, to find the, the information you want. And for PyBullet, you have all the information, but in the big Google Docs, so not so easy to uh, search in. Uh, I hope they will change that. For visualization, we are using Wisdom. We could have used TensorBot. Yeah. But when you use Pilot, how do you generate images? Uh, well, with, we use PyBullet, so with PyBullet you can um, set up a camera and you define a camera and from that camera you can retrieve the image. Also PyBullet allows you to retrieve a uh, depth image and for if you are using uh, the small render you can also have a segmentation uh, from the image. But uh, can the camera go, uh, move? Can the camera can also move, yeah. Yep. And um, okay, uh, so uh, I was I used the work done by people at Insta before. So um, uh, good question. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, Uh, and only becomes non-deterministic if you use uh, the quicker uh, 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 running. Ah, uh, yeah. But w when I said non-deterministic, it's more about just launching Gazebo, not uh, running the simul. <laughs> 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 uh, and you have some fatal errors, but it's still working. So, 
that's yeah. Uh, that's what uh, I meant when I wrote. Uh, and I think we we switched to PyBullet because of one of your email where you said you tried also and and that was cool. <laughs> okay. Um, so we use uh, Vistum as for visualization. Visualization. So it just allows you to have a live um, feedback of your different training. You can have different server and ping in only one visualization server. We couldn't have used TensorBot, but in fact, we from the code we started from that was PyTorch agent. We there was that implemented, so we just kept that, and that was working fine. Uh, also, I will just talk about uh, it's more uh, technical about how do we keep uh, our project working even if we are four working at the same time on the code. Uh, so basically, we we just have a rule which is if we create a new feature, it's a new branch in Git. I don't know if how many. Of you are familiar with Git, mostly I would say. Okay, cool. Uh, and if it's done, then uh, we do a, what uh, a code review. So one of us uh, review the code of the other and put comments, and and that allows so that everybody um, understand the code uh, at all time. That um, that also ensure a bit uh, the quality of the code. And then after the comments, the uh, the one who submitted the pull request has to do so, has to answer the comments and also change the code. And until until uh, both agree, uh, then when both agree, we match it with master branch. So the the gold rule is that master branch should always work. So don't have a bug uh, when you just clone the repo and run basic thing. It should always work. And so also code review allows you to uh, to learn from from the others. So that's. That one thing that was not present when I arrived here, and and now it's working. Also, to organize our different, uh, yeah, the different things we need to do, we, we are using a, a Trello. I don't know if we are familiar with and with with the Kanban method. So you have basically a to do, doing, and done uh, column when you can keep track of uh, what uh, what you should do, uh, who, sh who is doing what, and what is high priori priority, what is not. And uh, yeah, so that, that allows us a bit to keep track of what the next steps are and what is done or not. So as a conclusion, uh, so I presented a stage representation for reinforcement learning. So prim, pretty, our first results are quite promising to also reduce so sample inefficiency of current reinforcement learning algorithm and also um, stabilize a bit in the case of PPO. So the current ongoing works we are uh, doing is working on more complex sites because here before we had only just one button, nothing uh, there, and the button just right uh, below the the robot arm. So we are trying with also uh, adding so different objects that are not useful to solve the task. We are trying to um, have rel to you learn a relative position, which is not so easy with robotic prior, instead of learning absolute position. And we are also trying with uh, two cameras, having two cameras, can it help to learn uh, state representation um, also because we are have a, a robotic arm in 3D, so using two cameras should help. And also uh, we plan to, uh, to try it on a real robot, so I think next week I will come here uh, to, uh, try to gather data with Baxter. Uh, yeah, so that's... That's our and here it just so thank you for your attention. If you have any question that at the moment. So this comes from the same article as uh, this this one. That uh, RL doesn't work yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. So there is something that's not uh, yet completely um, clear to me to understand uh, the, the result that you get uh, showing that learning the um, step representations uh, uh, makes the whole learning process more efficient. Because it seems that I have two hypotheses. Yep. Uh, maybe they are, not, uh, they are not incompatible, but like th I think there are two differences between the uh, orange curve and the other one. Yep. There is one wh which on which you are focusing, which is the fact that uh, it's not using robotic, various kinds of priors, uh, like <coughs> robotics priors, uh, 
But there is another one, which is that here you are jointly learning the representation and the policy, as opposed to decoupling yeah. representation exactly. learning from learning the policy. Yeah. And so, for example, I would be curious to see uh, to what extent you could put uh, robotics prior in the uh, in, in the algorithm which are jointly learning the, the representation and the policy to see which which is most uh, waiting on the uh, okay. on the added value of the of the approach you put. Well, uh, but wh where do you want to uh, include the robotic priors? Because robotic priors, usually you, you say, okay, those, uh, you, in, a, in a neural network, those units uh, should represent my states, and I will enforce on those states uh, that the prior are, are not violated. Uh, for this one, as output, you have only the action, so I don't know uh, where yeah, do you want to... I think, yeah, it probably it would need some little modification, yeah. but Probably, I think you, you could imagine ways to, uh, to to modify a bit the the standard PPO learning from the pixel with the CNN thing by by adding an objective where you need yeah. to, to it, the it could be a bit like Unreal um, yes. Unreal <laughs> where they have the auxiliary auxiliary task of trying to modify the pixels. Yeah, uh, yeah. there should be should be that also. Yeah, yep. that's exactly the question I was asking yesterday to Natalia, whether you can incorporate those robotics prior mm -hmm. inside the reinforcement learning architecture. And that would be, okay, you decide that this layer is the state, and you put the priors there, and otherwise yeah. you learn for reinforcement learning. To that sure. Uh, also, there's another thing um, that of the idea of learning states is that you can reuse them uh, later for a variation of your task. So, yeah. And you have also the question of interpretability. Yeah, sure, it should be a good idea to try an auxiliary, auxiliary task. No more question. <laughs> okay, so maybe let's continue discussion. We'll, maybe we can make a, a short pause now. Uh, yeah.